major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, August 20th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. It's a tough decision, but tonight the order to keep the border closed due to COVID could spell the end for more stores in the South Bay. KPBS reporter John Carroll with what some say could be the final blow to more business. It is the largest land border crossing in the world the fourth busiest in terms of daily crossings. It is a huge economic engine for both the San Diego and Baja California regions. The government closed the border to all non-essential travel in March 2020, the start of the pandemic. The closure has been extended month by month since then. And having it closed for another month is absolutely unacceptable. Back in June, Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina joined other local governmental leaders at a border news conference pleading with the government to reopen the border. He says there's absolutely no reason to continue keeping it closed to all travel except that deemed essential. And Dedina says there's an easy way to safely reopen it. I think it'd be reasonable to say if you want to cross into the border, you have to be vaccinated like other countries do. So let's do that, right? I think that's fine. The announcement about the continued closure came in a tweet from the Department of Homeland Security. It cites the continued spread of COVID-19, including the Delta variant, as the reason for the extended restrictions. Over 200 businesses have already closed their doors permanently, and they attributed this uh, specifically to the border restrictions. Kenya Zamaripa is the Director of International Business Affairs for the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. She points to the fact that vaccination rates in Baja California are at least as high as the San Diego region. Plus, people from Mexico can still fly into the U.S. with no restrictions. Mayor Dodino worries that the partially closed border has now become the status quo. A lot of us keep thinking this, this could be permanent. We hate to see that happen, but it, it seems like there's an endless litany of excuses. So as we head into fall, it remains unclear when the border will reopen to everyone. What is clear is the longer things stay as they are now, the more permanent damage will be done. John Carroll, KPBS News. At times, issues surrounding the pandemic have led to public outcry in the form of rallies and verbal disagreements. As KPBS reporter Melissa May shows us, what happened at the county supervisor's meeting raised not only tempers, but eyebrows. You need to know we're coming for you too. Some of the people who attended a board of supervisors meeting this week had strong feelings and a lot to say, including threats toward elected officials. But when does someone's right to freedom of speech cross the line into a threat that could land them in legal trouble? The general rule is that the First Amendment protects our right to speak however we wish. But there are certain categories of speech that are excluded from that protection. And one of those categories is called true threats. Matthew Hallgren is a First Amendment attorney with Shepard Mullen. He says a true threat can be a spoken or written statement threatening death or serious injury. Your children and your children's children will be subjugated! And no physical action is required. The person who makes the threat has to intend that the victim take the threat seriously and the victim has to actually and reasonably take the threat seriously. More than 100 people spoke during the meeting, and each speaker was given two minutes. Public comment is required by California law. You're about to open a pit of hell! But does it have to be civil? Civility is basically upholding the social contract. You have rights, I have rights. I'll respect your rights, and if we have a disagreement, we'll take it to a third party that we pick, and we will now adhere to what they rule. Carl Luna is the director of the Institute for Civil Civic Engagement and believes the pandemic has influenced our behavior. 
go pound sand, Nathan Fletcher. And I think the whole country has gone through PTSD because of COVID. And as we've gone back out in the world, we forgot all the stuff our first grade teachers and kindergarten teachers taught us about how to deal with each other nicely. You don't say anything to others that you don't want them to say to you. So we're coming after every single one of you. According to Luna, this trend towards hostile speech and behavior could continue unless schools begin to teach civility. Give students the needs or the tools they need when they run into people they don't agree with to have at least a constructive dialogue or at least not a destructive dialogue to try to resolve disputes. Orientation the meeting. Please take a seat. If you have been threatened and fear for your life or physical safety, you should contact the police. Melissa May, KPBS News. And we want to remind you about the Tracking COVID-19 section at kpbs.org. That's where we have all of our local reporting with the latest numbers and stories from our community. You can find the link right on our homepage. It's being called a historic infrastructure project and one that could help end our desire for water even in non-drought years. Here's KPBS reporter Alexander Van Hel. Mayor Todd Gloria says the Pure Water Project will dramatically reduce the need for imported water. San Diego currently imports 85 to 90 percent of its water from the Colorado River and from Northern California. This project will guarantee San Diegans a local water resource by using advanced technology to provide purified, recycled water. More than 50,000 water quality tests have confirmed that the water is safe and that it meets all federal and state drinking water standards. With sweeping drought conditions and water shortages across the state, Gloria says this project will sustain the city's water needs for decades to come. We know now that pure water will provide nearly half of San Diego's drinking water supply by the year 2035. California State Senator and former City Council member Tony Atkins has been working to develop the Pure Water Project since her time at the city. She helped secure $50 million in the state budget for the project. Although it's a small chunk of the monies allocated, she knows firsthand the need for clean water. Now, as a kid who grew up in rural southwest Virginia in a house with no running water, I have to say uh, we carried water from a spring. Phase one of Pure Water includes a North City Pure Water facility and pump station. The mayor says thousands of local jobs will be created with the construction projects that lie ahead. Alexandra Rangel, KPBS News. A group of residents in North County are calling for action to reduce the dangers of accidents due to speeding. As KPBS Alexander Nguyen shows us, they're calling for calm in the way of a new stop sign. This is Foothill and Beverly Drive. Vista recently approved a petition to install a four-way stop at this intersection after residents complained about the traffic safety in their neighborhood. Frank Polomczynski has lived near this intersection for only a year and already he's seen his fair share of accidents. We've seen multiple accidents. We saw a pedestrian get hit over here. I was home, uh, rendered aid to that pedestrian, dialed 911. Uh, and then multiple ask accidents over here on the Beverly side. Polinchinski's neighbor, Joe Vandenberg, also knows the danger of the intersection. He started a petition for the stop sign after being in an accident himself. On April uh, 13th, I was uh, hit by a car working in my driveway. There's over 4,000 cars a day that go through that intersection. And as you saw in his presentation, most of those, or the average of those, was 39 miles an hour. And it's a 35 mile an hour zone. The presentation he's talking about is from Sam Hassanen, Vista's lead traffic engineer. Hassanen says in the past five years, there have been six accidents at this intersection. Residents have complained to the city before asking for a stop sign, but the city's traffic study concluded the intersection did not meet the criteria for a stop sign. The city of Vista recently uh, updated our traffic common program, where we added stop signs uh, as a tool in, um, for speed reduction, where the residents can petition the city and with the approval of the Traffic Commission and City Council, the residents can have a stop sign installed for the purpose of uh, reducing speeds. Polinczynski says if Vandenberg hadn't filed the petition, he would have. He says Foothill Drive has become a major thoroughfare through the area. I was glad to see someone bring this up to the City Council. We've been almost hit several times by people driving well above the speed limit, um, cresting that hill and us not even have a chance to react. So. 
Um, so it, it was a welcome, welcoming to us. The city council unanimously approved the petition August 10th. The stop sign will cost the city $150. In Vista, Alexander Nguyen, KPBS News. Parents of children with special needs are outraged because the Del Mar City Council has taken action that could shut down the Winston School next year. It's used by students with learning differences from across San Diego County. Our new education reporter, M.G. Perez, has the story from Del Mar. The more I fight, the more I work. 19-year-old Robert DeMond is a singer with big dreams. He's working on a college degree in the arts, grateful for the education that brought him confidence and hope. There are more students just like me who need this opportunity to, to grow and uh, to get an education. Robert is a graduate of the Winston School, a non-public, non-profit school for students with learning differences, nestled here on a hillside with an ocean view in Del Mar. Since 1988, the school has supported children who struggle in their neighborhood public schools. Many of them are living with physical and emotional disabilities. Robbie struggled in the public school, public school environment, as do a lot of the kids here. And um, this school just accommodates them makes them successful, gives them a strong academic ed education. This safe haven for children with special needs is in danger of being closed because of a complicated joint land purchase and lease agreement with the city of Del Mar. The lease required the Winston School to provide the city with a redevelopment plan for the property in a process that started in 2019. The COVID pandemic crisis and shutdown caused numerous delays and miscommunications. The final extension deadline was July 23rd. July 23rd came and went, and Winston still did not submit a complete plan. It was still missing. It was you know, elements that the planning department said it had to have, and we had no choice but to do what the next step was and that was to terminate the lease. Last week, the Del Mar City Council met in a virtual special closed session to decide the fate of the lease. After less than half an hour of discussion and comments from only one citizen who signed up to speak, and that was in favor of honoring the school's lease, the council voted unanimously to terminate it. We really do change the trajectory of students' lives. We, we help kids achieve their dreams be able to go on for future opportunities where they might have otherwise been lost. We've been doing this really well for over 30 years. What we know for sure is that Del Mar's zoning laws and a critical provision in the land purchase agreement required that this property can only be used as a school and nothing else. According to the mayor, the city has no plans for commercial development. The Winston School lease runs out in 2023. Maybe this is a wake up call to all of us that the communications we've been having and how we've been having them have not gone well. So what happens next? I don't know. There's, there are many decisions and many opportunities for everyone who's involved in this. Robert Desmond holds on to his hope. <laughs> MG Perez, KPBS News. Governor Gavin Newsom is about to get some high-profile help on the campaign trail. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit the Bay Area next Friday, August 27th, for a public event supporting Newsom. Recent polling shows the recall effort is a tight one. No word yet on if President Joe Biden will also make a campaign stop for Newsom. The San Diego Registrar's Office says it's already received 160,000 ballots locally. And if California gets a new governor next month, it might be a talk radio host with no experience in government. As Kyung Law reports, the spotlight is shining on Larry Elder and his past controversies. There's going to be no questions. So. California gubernatorial candidate Larry Elder won't stop to answer our questions outside his public rally. What he prefers, the prepared stage and his fans. Elder is the leading Republican candidate in the recall election of Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom. This man that I'm going to defeat on September the 14th. 
a Trump supporter and talk radio fixture, Elder is energizing the Republican base. Larry Elder. I know it's a Democratic state. Larry Elder is the one that can save it. The momentum is going with, with, with the Republicans, hopefully. Morning, Road Ragers. A first-time candidate, he's never held office, better known for inflammatory, take-no-prisoners talk in conservative radio. His sharpest comments are on race and gender. I argue that the welfare state has incentivized women to marry the government. I've always felt that minorities and women complain too much about racism and sexism. In May 2000, Elder penned this editorial, writing, Women know less than men about political issues, economics, and current events, adding, The less one knows, the easier the manipulation. On family leave, Elder tweeted in 2016, you have no right to maternity leave. Just this week, Elder said employers should be able to ask women if they plan on getting pregnant. And I believe that a female employer could ask questions uh, of a female employee or a male employee. Uh, that directly impacts on whether or not that person's going to be available to work a full time, a full 40 hour week. On climate change, this was Elder's position in 2008. The bad news is that global warming is a crock. It's a position his campaign indicates he's evolved from, now believing man may be partially involved in climate change. But Elder spent years online promoting global warming as a myth. He also posted a 10 steps to fix America plan, which include abolish the IRS, eliminate corporate taxes, take government out of education, arguing it should be in the hands of the private sector, legalize drugs and abolish the minimum wage. That position has not changed. Elder tweeted this month, the ideal minimum wage is zero. One position shifting just this month, who won the 2020 election? To the Sacramento Bee. I do believe that Joe Biden won the election. Then just two weeks later, after blowback from the Trump base. Do I believe that Joe Biden won the election fair and square? Give me a mulligan on that one, Jen and Grant. No, I don't. Was there election fraud in 2020? Are you kidding me? But the factual flip-flop isn't sitting well with Trump supporters. <laughs> I'm answering the question. He didn't want to talk to us about it either. Uh, there was that last question, the second to last question. Why don't you talk about what else I talked about? Mm -hmm. Can you concern about any of those things? He didn't stick around long enough for me to ask. That was Kyung Law reporting. New numbers show how San Diego's workforce is recovering from the pandemic. The state reports our local unemployment rate was 6.9 percent in July. That is compared to more than 12 percent a year ago. Leisure and hospitality jobs made the biggest gains. San Diego is a full point better than the state jobless rate of 7.9 percent. One place where jobs are available is the airline industry, and one of San Diego's biggest carriers is trying to sweeten the pot. SDSU's Miro Kopik explains in the Friday Business Report. You know, the airlines are really in trouble because they have huge staff shortages. And, and, and the reason is during the pandemic, we saw air travel decline 95%. So they were asking workers last fall to take early retirement packages, unpaid leave. And so they kind of shrunk their labor force. So whether it's flight attendants, uh, ramp agents, customer service, you know, they're having, you know, hours long waits on, 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 on the phone. And this is all airlines, not just Southwest. But what they've done is they've sent incentivized their employees already. They're looking to actually give a referral bonus of $300 to employees. The bottom line is that what we're going to see across the airline industry is after the summer and, and you know, students going back to school, which they're starting to do right now, that leisure travel is going to decline and, and some of that pressure is going to come off. The big unknown for all the airlines, and this is what we're going to keep looking at, is, is that business traveler and whether the business travel segment comes back in any way, shape, or form. And with the Delta variant right now, that's going to be hard to predict. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, the chaos continues. Desperation at Kabul's airport, and President Biden pledges a plan for evacuation. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Pretty dry, quiet times ahead for us as we head through this summer weekend. We're really uh, looking pretty nice, and guess what? 
slightly warmer into next week. Not really a whole lot changing. We have turned off the monsoonal moisture, so that is gone for us, and that means tonight we are fairly quiet out there. A few marine clouds still sticking around 74, the low 66 in Oceanside. And as you head towards a place like Mount Laguna, we're in the upper 50s, Campo 56. Future cast showing us other than the coastal clouds, there's really nothing going on across much of Southern California. So everything very quiet out there and uh, pretty uh, quiet uh, for basically monsoonal season, which doesn't have much moisture associated with it. Fairly shut off even in through Sunday. There's a few spotty thunderstorms out there that could venture into the end of the weekend for parts of southern Arizona, New Mexico, but far away from us. So our story really is dry for tomorrow. Other than the coastal clouds that will be out there in the morning, 75 the high for the afternoon. And as you look around the region here, you can see most of us hanging out in the 60s, 70s or in Borrego Springs holding on to the upper 90s. Your forecast for the next couple of days showing us we trend in the 70s towards the coast and actually we'll get a little bit warmer into the middle of next week, closer to 80 degrees, but most of us hanging out in the mid 70s for the weekend towards the coast and those low clouds will give way to more sunshine. Inland locations, mid 70s to upper 70s, but we'll be back into the mid 80s and lower 90s by the time we get into the middle of next work week. So that's that warming trend I was talking about in the beginning and that will continue for the mountains too as we head into Wednesday where temperatures will be back into the mid 70s. Of course, that's a weekend after uh, we are close to 70 degrees for that high desert locations still holding on to the 90s, but that will change by Monday and Tuesday as we get a little bit warmer for the later part of the week. For KPBS News, I'm AccuWeather Meteorologist Melissa Constanzer. San Diego's Pride Annual Out at the Park is underway down at Petco Park. The event was canceled last year due to the pandemic, but it's back tonight as the Friars face the Phillies. The Pride event is sold out. Along with the special tailgate party, attendees get commemorative souvenirs and proceeds go to Pride's year-round education and advocacy programs. Two transgender youth will throw out the first pitch. A well-known art gallery in Hillcrest is celebrating its seventh anniversary this weekend. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando has a preview of the Studio Doors' latest exhibit. I'm an open book, honey. Uh. Quick one word for my definition of drag is freedom. Mm. I can get away with anything, you know, within reason and really go for it. And um, my limits aren't quite there anymore. Uh. <laughs> drag for me on a personal level is an extension of what I'm feeling inside. So, you know, it's usually very colorful and very over the top. Mm. The cool part about drag too, is that I feel like it's a little bit of a revenge on my childhood because I get to do all of the stuff that I wish I got to do as a kid. <sighs> I got stuck here in San Diego and I needed to make some money quick and I've never been good at being like a hooker. So I came up with this idea of doing a cigarette girl it was very successful. I paid my own bills for about three years, and then I hired four drag queens. Mm. Drag is a combination of art and activism. Oh. You can't pull off drag without an insane level of artistry and creativity. Mm. Yeah, drag, I've always said, is the mother of in invention, right? Oh. Tootie is one of the San Diego drag icons highlighted at the studio door this month. Mm. We're always looking for different kind of materials to make things with. I once made a, a crown um, out of hubcaps. Mm. Paris is another icon, and her drag performances are famous for inspired costumes. I have like my carousel dress that has the horses, you know, roaming around it and it lights up. Mm. But doing drag, even in ridiculously cute outfits, is still at its core a provocative act because it's pushing boundaries and challenging society's norms. Maybe that's why drag queens are also often activists. That's like one of the, like, the proudest parts about being a drag queen is that we are those ones that, you know, when something goes down in the community, you want to be the kind of bright light part of it first off, but then you also want to be the part that is involved in helping. The drag is just an added tool to get more attention. That's why the community looks to us when there is a cause or something, because we will bring people out where visually 
uh, stimulating. Indeed they are, and the Studio Door exhibit proves it, with not just spectacular costumes on display, but also visual art from painters like Margaret Chiaro, whose series of drag queen portraits line one wall at the gallery. This is not my personal narrative, but one I greatly admire, and I love seeing people that are so comfortable in the spotlight and are obviously artists that can carry that all around the world where I hide behind my paintings. Patrick Stillman, the Studio Doors owner, says activism and drag queens go hand in hand, which is why Nicole the Great, another San Diego drag icon, worked with Stillman to create this Saturday's event as more than just a reception for the exhibit. The heart of that is to raise funds for two great food charities, the Emergency Food Voucher Program and Take What You Need Tuesdays. Tootie recalls protesting at a Hillcrest 76 station years ago when the owner was mistreating a gay employee. And I paraded around that corner for three days nonstop with a beehive and a big 76 ball on the top of my beehive. Activism has always been a bit, very big part of what I do. And humor always helps. It breaks down barriers. I think the shine kind of catches them, you know, and the color kind of catches them off guard. And then the, the humor breaks down all the barriers in between. Those barriers are coming down in part thanks to the flamboyant fun of drag queens. But it's fun fueled by an underlying sense of resistance to conforming to anyone's norms and the creativity to make magic out of anything. <sighs> and that's what the studio door is celebrating on its seventh anniversary. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.